Good morning, folks. Welcome to day two. Champions Chess Tour Julius Bear Cup. How's everyone doing? Let's see, I think games have already started, so we should have matches for us. Let's get into it. Let's uh, let's find some games. We gotta refresh the page. Get some fresh games. Uh, <clears throat> lots of great matches. We got Aronian Serana, Nepo Fedoseev, Amin Sulamanli, and Fresene against Artemiev. Uh, we're going to try to follow all the matches as best we can. Of course, this is just the winner's bracket, folks. We also have a loser's bracket as well. A bunch of very strong players and some tough, tough matchups there. Hey, how's chat doing? We got PB in the chat. Thanks for following Notorious. Oh, we got the squad stream invite. Hey, Mitch with the 38 months. What's up, Mitch? How's it going? Okay. Oh, the game um, needs to update. Sorry about that. Queen went to B6. Hey, Junior with the six months. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, so this is the uh, Julius Bear Generation Cup. This is... One of the events in the series of the Champions Chess Tour. So it's all rapid chess, basically. They're playing 15 plus 3. And it's all part of this tour. So we're covering Division 2. The winner of Division 2 qualifies for Division 1 in the next event. The winner of Division 3, which is below us, qualifies for Division 2 of the next event. Uh, Division 3 is also like totally, totally stacked, by the way. Um, and overall, the way the tour works is if you finish, I think, in a certain placing, like top four or something, in these events, you qualify for their eventual uh, Champions Chess Tour final, which I think is going to be in person at some point uh, later this year. So, yeah, this league is, like, insane. I mean, we got Nepo here and Aronian playing in Division 2. You know, they're trying to, like, qualify and get back to Division 1. That's kind of their storyline for this event um, but of course they have to deal with some uh, pretty uh, pretty tough customers along the way um, so yeah let's uh, let's get into it I think we can turn on the move sounds um, so this is uh, game one between Nepo and Fedoseev. So today, uh, like yesterday, in the winner's bracket, they're playing four game matches. And Fedoseev comes out with the uh, Petrov. A bit, of a, a bit of a troll against Nepo. Of course, this is Nepo's main opening. It's always funny when you play someone's main opening against them. You're like asking them, all right, like, all right boss, show me. Like, show me what's, what's, the most, what's the most annoying line to face. Tell me, tell me. So I know next time when you play Petrov, now I'll know, like... <laughs> what you think is most critical. So Nepo goes for d4. And uh, yeah, they're playing best of four here, 15 plus three. I feel like this is quite a trendy line these days, though I'm definitely, definitely not familiar with all these um, Petrov lines. Um, but looks like Nepo sacrifices a pawn right out of the opening. Kind of typical Gambit style, castles. Oh, but he wins it back right away. We got this position with the opposite color bishops. Queen d7, very uh, very serious move, I gotta say. Rook b5, queen c6. Comes here, rook c5. Yeah, there was a question why white wasn't grabbing this um, this pawn on d5. That's a great question. He played f4 instead. Uh, could have taken this one with the rook, could have taken this one with the queen. Honestly, not sure. I mean, in both cases, the bishop gets to e6, and black gets a nice tempo. But at the same time, it is it is a pawn that Nepo was not grabbing. Uh, I'm sure he had good reason not to take it. But uh, yeah, he after a bit of a thing goes f4. So they're they're well out of their book at this point because they've already been been spending a couple minutes each. C6 h3 and queen a6 well clearly white is playing with a concept he's trying to advance his kingside majority so one day he wants to push g4 or just maybe f5 of course he's going to have to support the 
key pawn before he can do this, but seems like he's playing for this advance. But yeah, I'm not sure why Nepo didn't didn't take the pawn earlier. You know, my guess is he didn't want to allow bishop e6 and then bishop takes a2. Maybe this pawn doesn't seem super scary, but if black is able to take that one, then long term the a pawn and the b pawn might be uh, annoying. Okay, so queen slides over to g3. Very reasonable decision to keep queens on the board for white with the opposite color bishops. If you feel like you're attacking here, then you definitely want to be the one that keeps pieces on the board. The more heavy pieces that white has, the more potential there is for a uh, checkmate. So yeah, bishop b2, and this position is just kind of flowing for Nepo. Rook is going to come back to c3 at some point and slide over to g3. Of course, e6 is an immediate threat right now, actually, in the position. Um, he seems to not be worried about queen b6. I guess queen b6, there's bishop d4, just kind of protecting everything. And then e6 is still... Still a big idea for white. F5 as well. F5, F6, for example. So, yeah, Nepo really going all in here on the dark squares. And, uh, yeah, his position feels feels very fun for uh, for white. And tricky for black. Though black maybe has some counterplay, like some rook e6, rook g6. But I'm not seeing it. Rook e6 immediately just runs into F5. And everything is, is defended and white is the one that's, that's knocking here. So we'll see, we'll see. But uh, yeah, Fedoseev definitely looking under some pressure here. Folks, you let me know. This is our stream. We can jump to any game we want. I do want to keep an eye on Aronia and Serana. Uh, for me, this is one of the most interesting matchups of the day because it's like a battle of uh, generations. You know, Levon, he's been around for a little while. He's just an elite player. Serana, very much up and coming and very, very good in the uh, online formats. So on paper, Aronian feels like the favorite, but in practicality, you know, anything can really happen in this match. This guy, Serana, very dangerous, folks. Very, very dangerous. Yeah, Mitch, I've been doing good. Uh, we've been busy here at the dojo. Uh, working on the training program. That's probably been most of the time lately is <laughs> working on the training program, trying to improve it, the, the user experience. Um, but uh, yeah, things are going well. If you're new here at the dojo, we do a couple things. We've got a training program. We've got a Discord server that's public to everyone. We have a, a private Discord server as well for the training program. Um, recently, actually, we launched a league tournaments um, that run every week. Uh, so like we got like blitz events, rapid events. We're going to be starting some classical events actually this weekend, folks. We're going to be doing one uh, like a one game a week kind of thing where we're going to have, I think, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Three options for uh, for classical games. So that's going to be kind of cool. We're going to post an announcement in the Discord about that. But um, yeah, that's happening this weekend, which is pretty exciting. Um, so yeah, definitely join the Discord. And there's a new Dojo Liga section where you'll see we have a bot that can verify you. You can join the, uh, the Lee Chess team and uh, get signed up to play in the events. And the cool thing about the League is that all of the events are going to get tracked on the leaderboard. In fact, the leaderboard is already already live. Um, and uh, yeah, so all you have to do is like participate in tournaments, score points, and then you get tracked on leaderboard, see how you do. We're going to have like monthly leaderboard, yearly leaderboard, and then at the end of the year, we're going to use this league to kind of determine our uh, dojo championship. So we just launched that like this week. So that's, that's very fresh. <laughs> We've been working on that for a long time, but that, that is actually a very fresh <laughs> addition <laughs> to the dojo. Um, okay, the ratings on screen to me 
look like chess.com rapid ratings, though I'm not really sure. Um, they could be FIDE ratings. Uh, it's always hard to say. Um, in fact, it's probably easier to figure out the position at hand. So two bishops for Serana, and he's got some pressure on the D file. So I feel like black is probably okay here, but white was kind of hitting this C pawn, and it's not really clear what's going to happen in these complications. Feels like white might be able to pick up a pawn. Maybe some bishop b5, rook drops back. Seems like Aronian can actually get grab this one to my eyes and, uh, and get some extra material here. At least an extra pawn, which would be quite nice. Is it enough to win the game? I'm not sure, but definitely feels like white is the one pushing here. Uh, when will Nihal's game start? You know, Nihal, I'm not sure if he's playing yet because there's a lot of matches in this division. But um, let me actually grab the link for you guys and pin it in the chat. And then you'll be able to um, see all the standings to the event, the brackets, uh, the games, and everything. And yeah, he does grab the pawn. Rook drop back. Now BC. There's an interesting moment there. I think both players calculated this one. Bishop e5. Had white taken here, black could take on c4. And if bishop takes d8, I think queen takes d8 would have been the key move. And then white can't take the bishop on c4 because if rook takes d1. And white now has a problem with the d3 pawn. You got to go like knight c1 or something very passive. Uh, to defend as well. Probably just this move. And yeah, I can imagine Aronian didn't want to play this position. So that was kind of left under the surface. Rook c3 played instead. It takes, takes. Queen c6. And now rook to d2. And so it's still an extra pawn for white. But kind of a healthier extra pawn. Feels like the knight is freer now to start maneuvering. And... Uh, jumping around especially this a5 square feels very very juicy or maybe even b4 square black goes h5 um looks like he's just trying to improve his situation on the king side maybe take away the g3 square maybe even play for a g5 g4 trying to get counterplay that would be kind of my inclination here in this position rook d4 very interesting Taking some squares with the rook. Now knight b3, he wants rook a4 maybe. Oh yeah, let me pin this link in the chat so everyone can um, see it. And uh, wait, did we mess up the... We did. We did. Of course we did. <laughs> I, thought, I thought we might have. Of course we did. All right, that's better. That's better. Now we gotta we gotta adjust it so it's it's just right. OBS chess.com, everything is so 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 delicate these days. You move one thing and the whole system collapses. All right, here we go. There we go. There it is. Beautiful. Beautiful. So yeah, Nihal right now, he's playing Raf Mamadov. Nihal had a tough day yesterday. I don't know exactly what happened still. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll ask the, the folks behind the scenes. They might know. But Nihal um, was 2-0 against Serana yesterday. And uh, ended up losing the match. I mean, basically the first two games... From what I could see, weren't weren't played. Um, just zero and two. And then he lost the third game, and now he's in the losers bracket. So Nihal, one of the best online players in the world, has his work cut out for him if he wants to catch up. Like he still has a chance, but it looks like he just lost this uh, first 
game against Mamadov after rook takes g6. Oof. Brutal sacrifice. Queen takes g5 coming, and then Black's King is essentially just getting uh, roasted here. Um, oh, looks like yesterday he had issues with the camera. So that's why he had to forfeit the first two games, essentially. And today he's lost the first one. It's two game matches in this loser's bracket. So he's going to have to win on demand in the next one. So very, very tough spot actually right now for Nihal. Raf Mamadov, super strong player, had a very close match with Aronian uh, yesterday. And was winning the Armageddon up a queen almost, but just barely lost it. And uh, yeah, now he's, uh, well, he also wants to get back and qualify uh, for the next stage. Okay, let's go back to Nepo because this game is uh, very much heating up and I feel like Nepo has been playing a middle game masterpiece so far. So Bishop D4, once again avoiding the queen trade, F5. Yeah, everything just kind of flowing very, very smoothly here for white. Queen F8, King H2, B6, Rook drops back, Bishop E3. Rook b3, avoiding any kind of d4 pushes. Queen d8, f6, and now queen e8. So this is the live position on the board. Oh boy, two and a half minutes for Fedoseev. Feels like a very, very tough defense for black. I mean, the rook is on h7. Black just played queen e8. Trying to take uh, this pawn on e5. So position still remains very, very complicated. I don't think white is just crushing here. But it does feel like white has a very nice initiative uh, and might might even have something concrete. It would definitely be just considering the exchange sacrifice, given that black's rook is just very weird on the, on the king side. But I'm not sure if that would really... I'm not sure if that would actually be good for white. Because after takes, takes, black can maybe even just go gf taking advantage of the pin, and then the rook can basically get back into the game via g7. So this I don't think is that impressive for white. But what to do? If rook takes b6, queen takes e5. I was thinking rook c6 here maybe is a move, threatening a very devastating back rank. Imagine folks getting back rank mated because of your rook on h7. I mean, it's just... Just brutal, you know what a what a day. I mean, you you would, you'd have to bench the rook for the next game. There's no way you could let it let it play again. I mean, that's just yeah, horrible performance by that rook. But um, I'm sure Black would have a move there. An e6, e okay, wow. Nepo and Fedosev is not impressed. He's like, okay, whatever. Take your. I don't care. I saw that coming. I saw it coming. Rook b8. I don't. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care about your e6. All right, but I think Nepo is now going to push e7, and this is going to be like, oh, bishop takes c5. Oh, this is, this is definitely game over. All right, there's a lot of tactics here. We can, we can go through these one by one. Right now, if bc, and I think the idea is ef check. Queen cannot take because the rook will be hanging. And then if king takes, that allows fg check, and then it's it's all over. The, the, either white's promoting or we're getting rook f8, and it's uh. It's GG. So so bishop takes c5. I don't think black can take this one. The pawn cannot be taken because of f7 check. And um, just to go back one one move earlier, if queen had taken here, then, then this would also have been devastating. After takes, takes, f7 check. White gets rook, takes b6. Bishop takes c5. And black's position is just collapsing. Um, this pawn is, is just way too strong. So bishop takes c5, g6 on the board. This is the live position. Nepo still thinking how exactly to uh, to end this one. Lots of good moves here for white. Bishop e7 looks completely reasonable. Um, e7 now, you do have to be careful. You don't want to... Because now, at some point, the bishop might, might hang. Actually, at this point, I think black is starting to take. Because ef, black can take with the rook and everything is defended. So white does need to do something with the bishop. Bishop d6 is another option. Uh, that feels like it makes a lot of sense. Of course, white can also take the pawn on b6. So lots of moves here for Nepo. He does go bishop d6 with the tempo. This makes a lot of sense. Now for rook d8, I guess he wants maybe bishop c7, maybe bishop e7 with another tempo. Just not giving black a chance to breathe. 
and if this pawn gets to e7, then, I mean, that feels like a strategically winning position for, for white, basically. I mean, the, it's a protected passer on the seventh rank. It's very strong. I mean, it's very strong. Maybe black has a blockading chance, one in a billion, but uh, yeah, pawn on e7 just looks looks absolutely... Yeah, pawn on e7, rook on h7, you don't you don't hold this position. I mean, I, I don't remember exactly what chapter uh, this was in, in Silman, but... Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is not not great for for black. Um, but okay, uh, one minute for Fedoseev, and uh, he's known to be a great, uh, very resourceful defender. So I'm sure he's not giving up yet. Rick c6, definitely a good start. Just kind of defending and attacking. We'll Nepo try to convert this one. So first off, Bishop. Seems to need a square, maybe bishop e5, bishop a3. Maybe the bishop could land on d4. There is a rook takes c2 in the position, which seems like Nepo wasn't really worried about. I'm not sure what would have been the response. Rook b2 maybe, but... Rook h5, Fedosev trying to uh, desperately get the rook back into the game. But here's the thing, even if the rook... You don't. You can't even play rook f5 because white will trade and come in, and literally checkmate you. Like if bishop d4, rook f5, for example, white just takes queen somewhere, queen in, and I mean this is, uh, yeah, this is devastating. Okay, there's still some concrete questions, but rook takes c2, rook g3. You just kind of defend everything. I mean this e pawn is is uh, devastating. So very very tough situation for black. He does go bishop d4. And I don't think we're going to see rook f5. I think that's just uh, just the blunder. Black has to, for better or worse, keep the rook on h5. And, and try to defend as best as he can. Rook takes c2. Now we're either going to see rook slide over or rook b2. So yeah, look, rook slides over. Nepo still doesn't want to trade any pieces. And uh, yeah, rook takes e4 here makes a lot of sense. Uh, maybe even right now, but in general, just because, yeah, White's Bishop and combination of F and E pawns are just very, very strong. Um, and this Bishop on E4, it's kind of holding everything together for Black, so it makes sense to just lop it off. But uh, of course, you don't want to just take and then not totally understand what the plan is from there. But okay, I think we can take, for example, then Rook can go to D3 and D8. That would seem pretty strong. But what's the rush? What's the rush, folks? Nepo just grabs the pawn. Bishop takes b6. Okay, Fedosev returns the favor. Rook takes a2. And now what? I'm sure he's looking for queen takes h5, rook to g7, but... Doesn't seem to be a forced mate there yet. Uh, but soon, I'm sure. Okay, queen d1. Pretending like he's not eyeing that rook. Just pretending like, oh, I don't want to go queen takes h5 at the first possible moment. All right, queen b8. Bishop should drop back to e3. Although queen takes f4 is not really a threat. And Oh, rook takes e4. There is the exchange sack. And is the queen coming into d8? What's the follow-up? I think queen d8. Just getting that second queen. That's it. This might be GG, folks, because this is just uh, promotion and and uh, checkmate. Okay, queen e5. But there's no, as long as there's no sack. Oh, hold on. Hold on. <gasps> hold on, folks. Rook takes h3. Holy smokes. Beto say I've just turned it around. What a swindle. What a swindle. And that's it. It's mate. It's mate on the board. He's going to resign. He has to resign. It's game over. He's either resigned or he's left his... I think he's just left his computer. I think this is a leave your computer. No, it's over. It's over. Unbelievable. Fedosev, he found this last trick. Queen e5. Setting up the queen to h5. 
Nepo thought it's over, promotes. Rook takes h3, and that's it. That's it, Fedoseyev takes the first game. He was losing the whole time, defending the whole time. That's it, one trick. It's game over, King had to go back to g1. And queen a1 is made on the board. Queen d1 only move. And uh, black would just take it. Oh, that's brutal. That's brutal. And the rook that came from h7 delivers the killer blow. I mean, honestly, disgusting. Disgusting shot. Rook takes h3. And uh, yeah, could Nepo have spent a few moments there to, uh, to have avoided that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what to do in, in this position here? White would need... Of course, it's not so simple because Rick takes h3 is already, already a threat here. So perhaps queen d8 wasn't, wasn't best for white. Maybe queen d7 would have been stronger. Because you're covering h3. Queen e5, you promote, and if black doesn't have rook takes h3, then it's 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 game over. Yeah, so after queen d8, queen e5, yeah, the queen is gonna be covering this one, so so the, the none of the sacks work. Yeah, what a what a crazy uh, what a crazy turnaround. Bishop d4 looks like it probably would have worked as well, um, because if Rook takes h3 here, you would go. No, no, no. This this is this is super unclear, right? This is okay. This here we're <laughs> we're not promoting yet. We're not promoting yet. So wow, wow, huge turnaround. And uh, okay, Fedoseyev wins the first game, and they're going to be moving on to their game two. Uh, in the meantime, we have some games finished already in the loser's bracket. Um, I want to catch up to this game. And looks like Serana won that first game against Aronian, also with black. And also from a position of defense. So bishop to c6, Juan played f4, really going for it. He has his extra pawn, rook to b8. Wow, so he sacrifices the knight. He goes d5. No, 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 no. Hold on. This seems like some kind of... Some kind of blunder. I think I think Aronin just either hung the knight or he he, he miscalculated something. Okay, but... Uh, yeah, crazy blunder from Levon in round one. As he uh, just drops the piece in the time scramble. And uh, loses the first game. So they're on to their game two. Uh, Fresene Artemiev, they drew the first game. Yeah, Fresene yesterday, he won a nice match against Dreyev. Uh, I believe two and a half, half. Uh, so this first game was a draw here. And Aiden Sulemanli. Uh, this kid defeated Basi Manman in the first game. This this kid Aiden actually so far has has done fantastic. Uh, yesterday he won a very nice match, and today he's now leading 1-0. Let's just quickly see what happened here. Kings Indian. This is uh, Amin's specialty. He's one of the best Kings Indian players in the world, and I'm very uh, grateful to him for it. Okay, I mean things got things got pretty sharp as usual. Knight takes f3. Okay, a lot of maneuvers. A lot of maneuvers. Eventually, ooh. Ooh. White got the counterattack. A6. Oh, very unpleasant move. Takes knight takes d6. Wow. 
Wow, nicely spotted here by the kid, because Rook takes Rook B8 check. And uh, Black is just not able to defend everything. Rook B8 takes. Takes. And game over. So, very nice win here uh, in game one. They're on to their game two. Yeah, Nepo Fedosev haven't started their game two yet, I can imagine. That would be very tilting for anyone. Um, but here's game two of uh, Amin against Suleimanli. And we have game two, Sarana Aronian. So here Aronian is really trying to bounce back. Um, let's just quickly see the opening in this one. Like it was a Slav defense. Knight c3. Serrano just brings out the horses. Goes e3. b3. Now bishop e7 here. This is actually shocking. <laughs> Not going to lie. I mean, I know for you folks, it probably looks like a very normal move. And sure, when I play like chess.com blitz against players between, I don't know, 1600 or so I would expect moves like this. But the main move in this position for years is knight d7. I mean, still the main move. And there's tons and tons of theory here, and Levon has played these positions um, with both colors a million times. So for him to go bishop e7 here is very, very strange. And it gets even weirder after b3 knight e4. So this is just like some totally... Totally rare concept. Usually the idea behind these early 94 moves is to play f5 and kind of stonewall it up. So Sarana decides to take right away. It was 92. F5. Hmm. I wonder if there was a secret trick in the position. Like if White had played Bishop B2, if Bishop B4 is now suddenly super annoying and like Queen A5. You never know with a Ronin. He has some very, very tricky prep sometimes. So F5. Bishop e2, c5, a3, a5, castles, queen e7, knight b1, bishop d7, knight c3, bishop c6, knight b5, and now knight d7, and we're back to the live position. So yeah, we got a very funky structure, and yeah, I'm not sure how much of this is like prep by Levon or just um, over the board improvisation. He might be a little bit frustrated as well. I mean, that first game he was doing very well and, and then seemingly just, just hung a piece from, from what I can tell, unless I, I was totally, totally missing something. But, um, yeah, Serana is actually well known to have really good preparation. And so a very typical strategy against players who are well prepared is to try to play offbeat lines against them and uh, force them to think on their own. But uh, it's not like Saran is like some kind of idiot. Like he knows <laughs> he knows how to play. <laughs> he knows how to play D4 positions. I feel like he's gotten himself a very reasonable position. It's a very dynamic structure. I mean, Black has like this kingside mass, and at some point you think Levon is going to be looking to push um, either E5 F4, or the other plan would be to somehow try to use the square for his knight, which is quite difficult. But that would be nice. In the meantime, Serrano's bishop here on b2 doing a lot of work. I don't know. I feel like white is a bit better here. Okay, there goes e5. So the drawback of this one is that it gives up the d5 square. So right away, actually, if, if white wanted to, he can even go knight c7, knight d5. And then rook d1. Eventually, bishop gets to c4. I don't know. I don't know how to evaluate that position. It's honestly hard to say. Um, let's say here, rook c8. Oh, rook c8. Okay, I answered my own question. So this one isn't possible because <laughs> it's just a, a tactical thing. But even if black plays something like this and we got this position, um, then black would still be winning because you have b5. But even if you didn't have this, let's just make some strategic moves. Rook d1, queen e2 or something. It's hard to evaluate a position like this. It feels like black is very solid. You, okay, white has the two bishops, but 
black is a very nice blockade. I would think even like this black is um, totally fine. So um, yeah, I don't think we're going to see knight c7, knight d5. Uh, rook d1 feels a lot more logical. King h1 also makes a ton of sense. Getting the king off of the, the diagonal of the bishop. Now if f4, f4, f3, I mean, it does start to look a little bit scary for white. So maybe uh, maybe Levon has something here. He also has ideas like rook f6, rook h6, queen h4. Just a very typical rook lift. So we'll see. We'll see. Not an easy position for, uh, for Serana to handle. Yeah, no, this one hasn't been a very, very thematic game. Uh, that's for sure. If you want to see some more classical chess, you know, you would follow a match like Alexeyev Dreyev. You know, two guys that have been around, they've read all the books, they know all the structures. These guys, they just play correct chess. Let's see what happened here. Accelerator Dragon. Okay, queen b6, actually, this is a pretty topical line. But yeah, eventually we just get this very thematic Marazzi structure. Um, first game in this match looks like Dreyev managed to win. Long knight endgame. Nice finish here, knight d7. Forcing black's knight off of the uh, promotion square. Now, uh, yeah, that was game over. Let's see. Ooh, we have a very interesting position here. I just want to jump to this one. So this is Yakubov against the Turizaga. Uh, these guys are in the loser's bracket. So they're playing two game matches um, before elimination. If they're tied after two games, they go to Armageddon. And this is game two of their match. Game one was a draw. But uh, this opening is just wild. I got to check what this was. I feel like this was a pin variation, just looking at the, the structure. Okay, similar, similar. Not exactly, but it was a con. And uh, we got some, oh, very sharp line here. Knight takes c4, knight b5, queen takes g7, h6, f3. Black gives back the horse, rook g8, c takes b5, and now d6. Both players out of book based on the time usage. So material has equalized. And uh, rook c1 here. A big problem for black? What's going on? What's happening? Very confusing. I don't know why rook c1 is not just winning for white. Rook g6 is met with queen h8 check. Black loses the queen. Um, so what What does a Turizaga have in mind on rook c1? Rook c1, 97. 97 is the move. Yeah, very good. Very good. Rook c1, 97. That's a great find. Only move for black. I'm, I'm sitting here so confused. Otherwise, otherwise that's it. <laughs> otherwise, the bishop is just lost. Um, but yeah, 97 would come hitting white's queen. Then it looks like white might be, or black might be okay there. So rook c1 played, 
97 instantly responded. We figure that one out. Now probably white's going to have to just move the queen if he wants to keep the initiative. Or maybe he'll go for the end game. Maybe he'll take knight takes and then play some move here. Now rook c7, knight d5. The rook is going to have to leave right away. So maybe just something like rook c2. And then just play this end game with the two bishops and extra pawn for white. Extra pawn kind of feels nice. Two bishops as well. Yeah, no, I think White is doing actually really well in this endgame. So seems like a big advantage for, for Noterbeck. He goes Queen F4. So he wants to keep the Queens on the board. Black is now going to have to move. Maybe Queen B6. Okay, Queen H5. Ooh, Queen H5 is unpleasant for White because now you're worried about Rook G6 trapping the Bishop. So White needs to make some, uh, some space here. Maybe Queen D2 so that the Bishop can evacuate. But this is still pretty double-edged. I mean, both kings in the center. Black is going to have knight e5 at some point. Yeah, hard to say how much better white is exactly. He does go queen d2. And yeah, we'll see if Eduardo can get enough. I mean, 95, you know, bishop drops back. This bishop can develop at some point. You got to be careful, though. Bishop b2, rook takes. Okay, I really want to jump to, yeah, Serana Aronian because Aronian has sacrificed a full rook and he is just going for it. Holy smoke. So e5, king h1, queen h4. I love it when top players do this because, like, I never know when it's justified. Knight c7, rook f6. Let's go. <laughs> Serana's like, all right, boss, I'll, I'll eat. I'll munch. Rook h6, h3. F4, and it's like, who's correct? Who is correct? White, Black wants to go F3, of course, and just, just mate. But uh, can White defend here in time? Saran is very tricky, so he... There's something. He, he is likely to find it. Now, rook to g1 is one move. Trying to go bishop f1. For rook g1, there's going to be f3 or queen takes f2. Hmm. Oh, he takes. This also makes sense because as a defender, a lot of times you want to open lines so that your pieces can, can defend a bit better. But this allows Levon to maybe think about e3, looking at this, or he can just recapture and try to push. Oh, yeah, but I like this EF4, actually. This is very smart by Serana, because now Queen C3 not only defends, it also creates counterplay. So 
Whoops, 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 not bishop b4. So Levon might might not be might not be right here. At least he's thinking about it. He's spending time. It's not a great sign. takes back. Now I feel like we're going to see queen c3. Maybe queen c3, black just plays knight f6. You just bring the knight in, you keep all your f3 options alive, and of course you stop, you stop mate. I know he goes rook g6, okay. Also possible, because here f3 is still kind of a devastating threat. Yeah, I like rook g6 better, actually, because now you also have, like, e3 ideas, as well as f3. Man, really, it's still a very tough call, whether uh, <laughs> I feel like black is enough here. It's really hard to say. Two minutes for Serrano. I mean, that's that's tough. It's hard to find the move here for White. This F3 is just super, super strong. Rook G1 maybe. F3, Bishop F1. Oh, but then Queen takes F2 there. Um, I actually don't know what Supercell is. So. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. Okay, Rook G1. But here I was thinking F3, and then if Bishop F1, Queen takes F2, threatening mate. Oh, Supercell owns Clash of Clans. Yeah, I think they're doing uh, collaboration. Yeah. sure what what the extent of it is but yeah i never play clash of clans i honestly couldn't even um tell you guys much about it other than it's it's i know it's a mobile game that's all i know really i honestly couldn't tell you like what kind of game it is single player multi i literally have know very little about it the only mobile games i've ever played are angry birds Yeah, like that's it, really. Just Angry Birds. <laughs> I can't get the good other one. Holy smoke. So B4 played. So takes, Rook takes. H3 is covered. Aronian goes E3. Holy smokes. Threatening to take on G2 and mate. So it's all about these four pieces here. And Saran, I think, might just be getting mated. What an attack by Levon Aronian. My God. And what to do? What to do? Rook takes G2 is now a threat. Yeah, I mean, beautiful attack. Look at this. F3 and then E3? Holy smokes. And the whole game, I couldn't tell if he's like tilting or a genius, you know? Okay, King H2. But now there's... Hold on. Check. There's G3. Serana so found a move. King H2. Does feel like black is on the verge of mating here. Queen takes f2. Looks strong, threatening to take on g2. He takes with the pawn. Oh, and this is just devastating. Here, white's winning back the rook. Rook takes g2 is coming. 
Queen G3 is another monster threat. This is game over. Serrano resigns. Wow. 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 Okay. So Aronian strikes back. And he shows that he is not one to be trifled with. Yeah. No kidding. No kidding. I mean, I felt, I felt that. I felt this game. I felt it. Okay, let's jump to... Hold on, this game. We haven't seen too much of this match. This is Esopenko Chugayev. Uh, these guys are super strong players, but they're in the loser's bracket, which means that if Chugayev doesn't win this game because he lost the first one, he's out. Esopenko is leading the match 1-0. Looks like he has an extra pawn in this position. Um, so Esopenko definitely looking like a big favorite to advance. Nihal Mamadov, I don't see the second game yet. Uh, nor do I see one for Nepo Fedoseyev. Check for an update on that. But uh, yeah, Chagayev facing elimination here, as is Alexeyev. He's still uh, facing Dreyev. And this one, he's going to have to win on demand. We have this game between uh, Aturzaga and Yakubov. That's still very, very complicated and developing. Bishop dropped back. B5. Five. Well, now the pawn is no longer hanging, but of course, Black gives up some some dark squares. So delicate position. I mean, I think White should be doing well here, but of course, when your king is in the center, it's always tough to play. Yeah, both bishops here have trouble getting into the game. For white, it's hard to move the bishop. For black, it's hard to really do anything with this guy. It's also hard to figure out what to do with either king. You know? Both kings here are going to be tough. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Rook C7. And, uh, yeah, Yakubov definitely, definitely going to be eyeing some Queen B4 ideas here. He spent a lot of time. I mean, I like White's position on the board, but on the clock, of course, things are very tricky. 
Yeah, he is definitely going for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Ninety seven back. So prophylactically defending against this one and also I think opening up uh, the queen to come to e5. And queen d4. White centralizes the queen first. A hey, business memo, thanks for following. And if white could just like castle, you know, put the king on h1, get this rook to c1, yeah, it'd be very, very nice here. But of course, until that happens, it's gonna be tough. That said, he does have the plan of artificially castling. King f2, bishop e2, and then trying to get the rook out. Of course, you always have to be careful you don't hang something, but yeah, there are there are moves white can make on the king side to kind of get the development going. Yeah, very, very sharp uh, position here. Keep an eye on the other game. So Esipenko, Shagayev, they did draw that second game. So Esipenko is going to advance to the next round. And it looks like... Oh, we have game two. Oh, we got to watch this. This is Nihal Sarin. We found game two. Nihal, a must-win situation here against Mamadov. So he has to win this Rick end game. He has two extra pawns. It should be a win. But it's always tough. And he just put his king on the h-file. And uh, I'm not sure if he has enough. He seems to think so with rook to g5. Now king comes into g7. Does look actually very good for white. I think it's over. I think it's over, guys. I think Nihal found a uh, very nice conversion there. Mamadov's looking, but what to do? The rook just doesn't have space. I think h6 now. Check. King will move up. Pawn is running up. Black is going down. And we're going to Armageddon. h7 now. What's the delay? Ooh, king f6. Okay. All right, but you can just promote and oh, but this rook is this rook is lost, folks. This rook is so lost. Yeah, you don't even need to be queen c5 check coming next, and it's game over. My experience there with Jesse helped us on that one. We knew it was over. We knew. So Nihal wins a very clutch second game. This is actually very smart what he did. I mean, he could have gone back and just kept the rook kind of defending both pawns, but he goes up and uh, whoops. He lost all the moves. He lost all the moves. He just goes up and then gives the e-pawn in order to win with the h-pawn. So very, very nice transition there. And uh, he forces Armageddon. So they're going to bid for that. Um, they're going to bid for who gets to have black with draw odds. Who's willing to take less time. Uh, and that will be starting soon. Let's jump back to this game. These guys are down to uh, a minute as well. First game in this match was tied. So if this game is also drawn, they'll go to Armageddon. Or if someone wins, they'll then they'll advance directly. So somehow we got the end game. How did this happen? Queen d4, queen e5 played. Noterbeck said, okay, I'm up a pawn, two bishops. I, I guess I'll go for the end game. It's not my favorite thing, but I'll, I'll do it. King f2 and... Now it feels like white is very much in control here. I mean, the, you got g3, the bishop can come out, rook comes out to c1. So Eduardo, yeah, he's trying to generate some drama here with e5. But uh, definitely looks like white's got the, the big advantage here. Take, take, bishop d4. Yeah, it's looking very scary for black. Got bishop f6 in the air. Probably knight g4 check. 
White's king, I think, is going to hide on g1 and then eventually try to kick the knight with h3. And yeah, I mean, it looks very nice for white. I mean, this bishop on d4, uh, it's hard to say enough. The bishop of the year, honestly. I mean, real wooden shield. You're defending b2, which is covering a3, defending b6, covering this diagonal, covering the king. I mean, it's just a superstar piece. Superstar piece. I, there's no other way to put it. It's like, it's worth four, four and a half points, at least. Maybe even five points. Um, this bishop. White's rook on c7 also strong. I would say six point rook right here. So white just needs the bishop to come out, the second rook to get in. Okay, rook g5. Very tricky. If I was white, I would just play h3. Just cover the check. Maybe he's looking for some rook f5. I'm not really sure. Black definitely wants to get the second rook with rook a4. And oh, and bishop b5 from Noterback cutting the second rook off. He wants to also play a4. Rook a5, he can just kind of lock it down. He's looking for he's looking for the mate, folks. He wants rook e1, rook e8, hashtag. He's looking for that hashtag. Hashtag rook e8. Rook f5 check. King e1. Maybe bishop d7 for black. Oh, but then bishop takes e5. Hard to develop here. Bishop takes b5. It's possible. He has to try it. I don't see another way. I mean, bishop e6, you know, white's going to get the pieces out and crash. So bishop d7, seven seconds for a Torizaga. We got some trades. Now it's rook versus rook and bishop against rook and knight. These guys are down to bullet. Torizaga very, very strong in these time scrambles, but Yakubov has the bishop and the extra pawn. D4. He wants to take on b6, but white can take on b7 at any moment. First, he brings in the king. Knight b6, he takes here. The seventh rank is also hanging, so knight drops back. Maybe rook b4 now. Yeah, very nice. Going after the d pawn. Black can't take. Then his position is hopeless. But now it's just two pawns up for white. And this is hopeless as well. So Yakubo should be winning this one. And then advancing to the next stage. Knocking Eturizaga out of Division 2. In the Julius Bear Generation Cup. Rick h6, h3. Um, any updates in uh, Fedosei of Nepo? I wasn't able to pull up their uh, second game, but actually we're going to be able to jump to it right after this. As, uh, yeah, Terzaga flags and completely losing position. And he's out. Yakubov advancing. Uh, let's jump to Nepo Fedosei of here. Fedosei of won that first game. After just uh, completely ridiculous, honestly, it should be illegal turnaround uh, of a of a swindle of a game. Um, this is game two. Nepo needing to recover here with Black decided to go for the Sicilian. You got a C three Sicilian. A little Olipin action. And it's pretty kind of dry. End game, white maybe got a bit of a, a bit of a pleasant pull here. Though Nepo seems to have managed to defend carefully. Ooh, 
f5, and now here comes the counterplay, e5, f4 check. That's how we got this uh, very interesting structure. Rook d5, h3, and then he didn't take this pawn. I think b4 was going to be a problem. Why didn't white play b4? Oh, no, no, b4, knight b7 still. Maybe some knight c4. Okay, now we're back to live position. Nepo managed to snag this pawn back, but had to push b5. And here we are, game two. Folks, I'm going to take a quick break. I'm going to leave the game live so you guys can watch. And I'll be back in a few minutes. And we'll keep it going. With the uh, Division 2 coverage on Chess Dojo Live. Don't go anywhere, folks. I will see you soon. All right, folks, let's get back to it. Looks like Nepo just managed to win this second game. Amazing and bounce back. Um, I think we have an Armageddon going on between uh, Nihal Saran and Rof Mamadov. So let's just run to this one. Folks, get a load of the bids for this Armageddon, right? So look, the way these Armageddons work is White starts with 15 minutes. The players, they both bid separately, anonymously, for how much time they want take with black not anonymously they know who, who puts the bits in but they don't know what the other person is bidding so Mamadov he bid 12 minutes he said I'll I'll take black it and draw odds if I can get 12 minutes on the clock or more Neil Sarin bid 11.59 got him with the one second so Neil Sarin got black in this game started with 11.59 and now has draw odds perfect bid but that said, still has to survive this game as Mamadov knows he's in a must-win situation. And is trying to win this game against Nihal. Um, let's just quickly run it back. We'll see what happened in this opening. Joko Piano, classic D4. 92 takes this one. Takes d5, 97. And a very sharp line by Mamadov where he sacrifices this pawn, but Nihal looks to have defended quite reasonably. He gives the pawn back, but forces white to trade off a bishop. Now black's position feels very solid. And this is the live situation. So this is division two. These guys are actually in the loser's bracket, so they're playing an elimination match right now. The loser of this game uh, ends their tournament right here, whereas the winner advances to the next stage. 
We also have a couple matches going on in uh, the winner's bracket, of course, but those are four game matches, so we will definitely keep our eye on those. Uh, Aronian Serana, 1-1. Uh, one, one. Th these Aronian uh, matches have been amazing. First of all, Aronian Serana, and then also Nepo Fedoseev. Just back-to-back -back wins. Um, in the meantime, we also have Artemiev. Looks like he took a lead against Fresenay uh, by winning his second game. There's a rook end game. Um, maybe we'll check that one out at some point. And uh, Aydin Suleimanli, the kid from Azerbaijan, he is leading 2-1 to one against Basim Amin. So he's going to be trying to uh, draw their final game, which just kicked off. So bishop c6, yeah, Mamadov playing for this e-file control. Just trying to squeeze and put a bit of pressure. Black goes rook to c5. Nihal very much defending here. Both players' tournament life is on the line. And yeah, now Mamadov has almost caught up here with Nihal. Six minutes versus five and a half. Because he's trying to figure out how to put pressure here. I mean, black is very, very solid. And it's hard to find a concrete plan for white. Maybe some queen e5 trying to get after the c pawn. You know, trades, rook comes in, rook c7. But uh, it's hard to imagine. You know, also this d pawn is going to be very weak. So Mamadov is really going to need to... Uh, Come up with something here. Okay, goes rook c1, offering to trade a pair of rooks. Trying to get the queen to c1, where it eyes this h6 pawn. But, not sure if this is really going to be enough. In the meantime, we also have the Armageddon started between Dreyev and Alexeyev. We'll definitely take a look at that one. And uh, there's no increment in this game. So at some point, this might come down to messy time scrabble. So Nihal decides to trade and takes on d5. And has Mamadov misjudged something here? Rook d3, there's queen f4. And Nihal might have found a way to hold this. Wow, what a trick. Rook d3 looks like it's just winning the piece. Black has queen f4 to get out of it. And if takes, takes, rook d7, trying to be all active, knight e6, holds everything. So Nihal definitely looking very, very uh, good here. I think this might have been underestimated by Mamadov. Oh boy, Serana Aronian also is like... <laughs> Is crazy by the way this game this is game three of their match Just quickly wanted to see what what's going on here this game has completely exploded Levon here was playing for the attack managed to get the center rookie one Bishop takes h6 played by Aronian Wow Wow Knight f5 check Queen h4 Man, Aronian is just uh, attacking machine today. Serrano is forced to give back the queen just to not get mated. And, uh, okay, looks like Levon was trying to... Trying to convert this position with the queen against the rook and knight. And, uh, yeah, he's going to be looking to win this one. 
And it feels like it should be winning for white. I mean, black is giving checks, but white can just bring the king closer to the rook. At some point, black will have to take this pawn. The king takes f6. There he goes. But white still has this h pawn, which in many cases is enough to win the game. The queen and h pawn, they're just very, very strong. White can also take here. It feels like all of black structure is collapsing. Yeah, queen takes a6 as possible. Knight takes a3 here as a blunder because of queen f3 check. Queen is just so, so strong in these positions, especially with the H-pawn. It's going to be very hard for black pieces to, uh, to deal with it. So, Aronian should be winning this one if nothing else uh, comes to pass. I'm going to keep an eye on Mamadov Sarin, folks, but honestly, there's not a lot going on here. Mamadov is now down on time. And in this heavy piece position, which is very, very equal, if anything, black is a bit better just because of the structure feels a little bit healthier. Um, white has a couple more weaknesses. So I'm expecting Nihal to hold and advance here. He's also very, very fast. So short of a catastrophic blunder, um, he should be winning this one. But yeah, let's watch this uh, Aronian game because this is very, very interesting. The technique here f4 so white's brought the king in now he's definitely looking to sneak this pawn in h5 h6 queen g7 check h7 and then touchdown touchdown wins the game touchdown wins the game so rook takes a3 in the meantime serana has managed to snag three pawns on the queen side so if he could somehow bring this knight back and then sack it for the h pawn and then get his rook in position and his king in position, you know, then we can talk about a fortress. But until that happens, Serana has a lot of work to do. Like folks, let me log in. I think this should be better. We were logged out. Oh, and we got the move sounds. Bravo. Okay, Ronian here still, still looking to convert. But it's very scary. This king is lined up on the fourth rank. Got to be careful. Got to be careful.
Bonin down to 10 seconds. He's basically just holding on the last of his reserves. Yeah, King F6 now. Dominate the knight and then King to G5. And Black here is just lacking the coordination. Now maybe check. And the pawn can start running. Should be a win for Levon. We'll see. Gives this check instead. Now can you can you get away with running with the pawn? Black's knight very precariously placed. There's no good checks. The rook moves, the knight is lost. Can Levon just get away with h6? And King e3. Serana. Just trying to get something going. He needs knight f3 check, rook h4 to get some kind of coordination back, but it's not looking good. He can probably just take and push now. Oh, and he finds it. And that's it. Serana resigns without waiting for h7. The knight would have no way to stop the pawn. Knight f3 check. King can go anywhere. And then white promotes. Sure, black has a couple pawns here, but this queen is just way too strong. It'd be just a matter of time before white could uh, stop the pawns and pick everything up. Still, you know, in a blitz time scramble, I would maybe play this on a little bit. You know, king and knight, you never know. We got the pawns, but yeah, of course, it's completely, uh, completely over. And, uh, oh, excuse me. Yeah, you don't even need h7. King takes h4 is actually a lot simpler. Don't even worry about the knight. Just promote this way. Also totally, totally winning. So Aronian is up 2-1. And uh, unbelievable, folks. Mamadov won the Armageddon. What happened? Oh, no. Oh, no. We had this position. And Nihal. Rook b8. G3. And then Rook a8. He must have mouse slipped. Oh, brutal. He just loses the rook. Unbelievable. Nihal has like the worst luck in this tournament. I mean, he's out. That's it. Mamadov wins the Armageddon. He advances. Uh, of course, this is a completely drawn position. And Nihal had more time. So, in normal circumstances, should have been able to just hold this one uh, quite comfortably. But, wow. Uh, just hangs the rook, some weird mouse slip or something happened there. And unfortunately, he is out. Um, we've got another Armageddon going here, actually, between Alexeyev and Dreyev. So these guys are even on the clock. This is a five-minute game, no increments. And uh, looks like White has sacrificed the exchange here at some point, but does have some compensation. Some annoying threats in the position here, so... Very, very unclear situation in this one. We also got Fresene, Artemiev. They're playing Suleimanli against Amin. And uh, Nepo, Fedoseyev. They're on their game three as well. We'll check back in with this game. We'll see what happens. Um, we've got this game here. Oh, wow. These guys have barely started. Uh, looks like another Petrov. This is round three. If you guys missed it, game one... Nepo was playing this beautiful attacking game, and Fedoseyev on seconds just found this like ridiculous swindle, truly ridiculous, and won the game. But then Nepo bounced back in game two, even the score, and now this is game three, and Nepo back in at least some form of control. Although in terms of the position, this one uh, feels very very even for the moment. So we'll probably keep looking around the horn, seeing what other live games we can follow. Because it's Division 2, we can do what we like here. Game 4 between uh, Aronian and Serana has started. We'll definitely keep an eye on that one. And we have a couple more winners matches to uh, take a look at as well at some point between Fresne Artemiev and uh, Suleimanli against Amin. Why don't we 
watch Fresne against uh, Artemio. Actually, these guys, they still have a lot of time. And how about this one? Amin against Suleimanli. All right, a bit of time here as well. So, okay, games in the winner's bracket definitely have time to, uh, to develop. And whoa, whoa, Tirana. Taking a page out of Aronian's playbook and just sacrificing the knight. Knight takes f7. Has the kid lost his mind? Or he probably has something. Queen f3. He's still in book. He's got 15 minutes on the clock. G4. He's playing instantly. He's winning the piece back. And uh, we're going to get some crazy, crazy position here. But very interesting. Serrano, of course, he's in a must-win situation. They're in game four in their match. And Serrano is going to have to win this one to uh, force the Armageddon. So very, very critical game here for both players. G4, G6 seems to have taken Serana out of book. He's caught him a bit off guard. He's not taking the bishop right away. I guess you can consider lots of other moves for white because the bishop is pinned. Maybe even E4. But, of course, at a certain point you're going to take. So he's just thinking about whether it's better to include some move. Maybe E4. Try to open it all up. Actually, I would 100% be looking at E4 here uh, if I was having this position. Because I'm trying to open everything up, open things up against the king, especially on the light squares. There we go, e4. Big move. Big move from Serana. He spent some time there. Maybe he recognized g6 wasn't the best move according to the engine, or he just remembered and took a little bit of time to figure this out. Aronian still going pretty fast. Bishop b4. White takes everything. Maybe these guys just needed some time to remember their preparation. Maybe they're both still in the book. What do I know? Queen can come out to f6. Knight f6, and okay, going to be uh, yeah, very, very sharp position. But this is exactly what Serana is looking for. He's in a must-win situation. So he's going to must-win. <laughs> he's going to... That, does that make sense? He's going to must-win? He's in a must-win. He is going to must win. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. It's a big situation here for Serana. In the meantime, loser's bracket filled with all the, you know, loser GMs that aren't. <laughs> I'm just Elimination bracket. Uh, Armageddon. Alexeyev is up. Four pawns and on the clock. Okay, three pawns now against Dreyev. Um, looks like he is going to win this one and advance, knocking Dreyev out of the loser's uh, bracket and the competition. Uh, 
That's it. Oh, he hung the rook. He hung the rook. Another mouse slip. Oh, there have been a couple mouse slips lately. Dang, brutal. I think Dreyev just kind of wanted to end it there anyway. Um, so he gets knocked out. Congrats, Alexeyev. He is advancing. And I think the folks in the loser's bracket are going to be playing a second match, if I'm not mistaken, because they're only playing two game matches. Um, so they're not too tired. They got time. They got time for one more. They got time for one more. Hey, what do you got to lose, huh? Okay, this is uh, Fresne Artemiev. Fresne is down one point in this match. Actually, we can quickly go back. I think we have a bit of time here. We can just see how Artemiev won game two to take the lead. Artemiev is just so, so strong. Very, very positional, technical player. Doesn't really go for a ton in the opening. Rather, just tries to get a position uh, that he can then play and look to use his insane technique. So here he just got a very calm endgame. And, uh, oh, rook d8, he found a nice tactic. Bishop takes f7. Possibly blundered by pressing a. So he gets this extra pawn. And that's it. Now it's just, uh, it's time for the machine to take over. <laughs> the Artemiev machine, you know, he just advances. G5. Looks like he just played this one perfectly. a5 king d8 a6 rook b4 the killer move and uh, Fresnay resigned this one as a7 a8 is now unstoppable and just earlier here black never had any time because white was always just going to go a7 and whenever the king is cut off on the back rank it's just always over even if it was black to play here black black is lost so this is just just winning so um very nice win there by artemiev so now they're in game three Fresne in white, having white in this game, trying to bounce back. And let's see what he is doing here. It goes for the Rui Lopez. You get a bit of a sideline, but these types of positions are pretty typical these days. And uh, 98, yeah, not much here for white. Not much here. I think he's maybe slightly better, but General Black's position is super solid knight is going to come to e6 At some point black plays maybe c5 and challenge for the a file if white doesn't uh double up also g6 bishop g7 okay i i do feel like optically does feel a little bit better for white but yeah and it does go d5 to our restrict the knight but we'll see, because now black can try to come back knight b7, knight c5. Maybe knight b7, he's going for something like this, and on knight c5, he could take. And try to play against black's uh, bad bishop, c4 or something. Not really sure. c4, probably not good. But, um, okay, he goes d5. And Artemiev is going to have to kind of justify his minor pieces here, because these optically look very passive, and for the moment, it feels like white is just kind of uh, cruising. So Fresene with some chances to uh, to bounce back in this one against his uh, younger and higher rated opponents. You know, F5 from Artemiev. EF quickly came the response. He was ready for this one. Oh, because of Queen F5, there's Knight D4. Does Fresne want knight d4? Knight d4 is a move, but then knight d4, queen d3. You might end up losing material. Who's tricking who? I guess you have to go back knight f3. Well, no one wants that. So rook a7 played. Rook a7 makes a lot of sense. Just putting pressure.
Okay, knight b7 covering the seventh rank, but not a very pretty move for black. Also, there's queen takes b5 right now. White wants. I imagine Artemiev goes knight c5 or something. Queen b5, knight c5, queen c6. Okay, Preston a doesn't want any of that. He just goes bishop e3. What a pro, just improving the position. Extra time on the clock. Yeah, very good chance here for, for Preston A. Let's keep our eye on Aronia and see what's happening there. That game's still developing. And Suleimanli against Amin also actually very, very sharp position with uh, Basim Amin in a must-win situation in that one. Okay, knight c5 played by Artemia. Will Fresene take this? He can take and go d6 check, but then there's c4. Artemia is so tricky. He's got that one covered, and then he can take this one back and be perfectly fine. So uh, he's happy. But White could take and maybe just play, try to play against that, that bad bishop in some way. Who knows? C5 still on the board. Fresne still mulling this one over. But if he doesn't take, where does the queen go? Yeah, you can't walk into knight d3 have to be like queen d1 which is perfectly playable because the pawn on c7 would remain hanging and then you could still do something with your queen from there queen b1 queen a1 but yeah he was definitely sorry i should say he was definitely thinking about taking and taking this one and decides not to i guess he figured black is going to have counterplay here c4 Bishop d6, maybe e4, and queen takes d5 coming. So, like e4 here, for example, and then the knight has to go somewhere, bishop d6. So this is what Fresnay was thinking about. He decides to avoid it. Just go queen a2. Now, though, introducing the threat of takes, takes, and d6, check, because c4 wouldn't be with tempo, so he'd, he'd have time to take on c7. So here, maybe king h8 now for black, I would expect. Not sure what else. Maybe B4. Before you just take it. Artemi of thinking. Down to one minute. It's not easy. It's not easy. Make the three. Quick up one. Just simple. Interesting he didn't put the rook on d1 or anything. He just puts it on f1. Just like maximum maximum protection over the f2 square. I guess he sees e4 coming. And remember guys, this is a must-win game for Fresne. If he doesn't win this one, he's going to be black in the final game.
Temyev just down to 15 seconds. Vladislav needs to uh, get the move on. Okay, rookie seven. Preston A definitely wanting to seize his chance. He has a huge time advantage. And they do have the three second increment, but three second increment is not that much here. It's a very tough position. It's very hard to find like normal good moves with just, just two seconds, three seconds, you know, over and over again. And some simple end game, sure, but here it's a lot of pieces on the board. So. He's singing about it. I don't know what's a play either. Okay, B4. I was thinking about B4. Just to fix this one. And Rook F7. Quick. From Artemiev. He slides over. He knows he has no time to run. Rook A8 trying to trade a pair of Rooks. This makes sense for White. Now the Queen can... Go after this B pawn. Temyev needs to uh, needs to move. Three seconds. Knight B two. Looking to transfer the knight to C four or play Queen D three maybe. Or both. Press an A, asking the question, Queen D3, Knight A4 might come, yeah, absolutely. Five seconds for Artemia, but he's very much going to be uh, on high alert here, just looking to play the best move. He might even take on F3 at some point, but hard to see the follow-up here because Black won't have a lot of pieces in, uh, in return to uh, keep the attack going. And folks, looks like Basi Maman managed to bounce back. He won game four. Unfortunately, again, we didn't get a chance to see much of it. But he wins game four, and now he's forcing Armageddon in his match against Suleimanli. So that match tied 2-2. We will definitely um, keep an eye on the Armageddon there. And uh, we'll watch Aronian Serana as well. Rana in a must-win situation. And now we're in the time scramble phase. Knight d1, knight takes c3. This might be getting away from Fresnay, actually, because now the d5 pawn is hanging. This might be all over. If Artemyev wins this game, he straight up wins the match, because he's already a point ahead. He's leading one and a half. Half. Knight g4, Fresnay. Trying very hard, but it's now down two pawns. And uh, Black's uh, position is looking mighty healthy now. Oh man, lots of games happening. We'll jump to Aronian Serana here in just a sec, but let's just watch a few more moves in this one. Bishop d4 can't take because of the rook on f7. Rook takes e4. Fresnay maybe striking back. Does he have some knight f6 checks in the position? Rook at e3. Press an a is playing with new purpose now. He's only down a pawn and has tons of compensation. Can he find a winning attacking shot? Some knight takes h6. Oh, but rook f8. Oh, white's queen is caught. 
What can he do? He has to play queen c7? Oh, but that's not what he wants. Now it's an endgame down a pawn, and Black's queen side is just running down the board. Artemiev, I think, has managed to force his way out. Just great defense on no time. Pressing A, yeah, just not enough time there to generate the attack. And he's down to just seconds in this endgame. Hoping to at least draw so he can get a game four, but if he loses this one, then that's going to be the end of the match, and Artemiev is going to advance. Artemiev definitely gunning for the win now. Rook F3, what a move. And now B3. Black spawns can start running. B3, C4. Knight C3, the knight comes in. Don't blunder, knight E2 check. Rook E1, but now B3, B2. Black's B pawn way too strong. And it's all over. That's it, folks. Takes, rook takes, rook comes to c1. And it's gg. Pressin' A resigns. So Artemiev, surprising comeback, but wins that game. Two and a half, half, takes the match after winning games two and three. Um, let's jump to Serana Aronian. Looks like they drew this game. Serana was in a must-win situation, but I think Aronian just totally control the game here and looks like draw was offered here Serrano with no time and less pawns probably a tough position so he draws this game meaning Levon advances to the next stage of the winner's bracket meanwhile we got Nepo Fedoseyev let's see if we can find their game four And doesn't look like we have it up yet. Let's see, do we have any live games? Hmm. We should have live games uh, soon. Folks, I'm going to take a quick break. And uh, we'll be back as there should be more matches uh, coming up. Looks like Suleiman Lee and Amen, they're going to the Armageddon. Uh, although that game hasn't started yet. All right, we'll take a quick break, folks, and then we'll be back shortly. Stay tuned. All right, folks, and we are back. Julius Bear Generation Cup Day 2, Division 2. We're watching the Armageddon match between Basim Amin and Aydin Suleimanli. This has been a very, very close match. We haven't been able to see too much of it, but 
Aiden won the first game, and then Basim Amin, he had to catch up in the sec uh, the fourth game in order to force uh, this Armageddon here. Now, he has extra time with White and the exchange. Black has draw odds. No increment in this game. And I'll tell you folks about the bids. The bids were quite interesting, I gotta say. Uh, Amin was... Amin put the bid in of uh, 13 minutes. So he was willing to play black and take draw odds if he was given 13 minutes to start. Uh, 13 and a half minutes, excuse me, to start against White's 15. Aiden, Aiden bid 7 minutes for black. So he started this game with 7 minutes and draw odds, but still 7 minutes, not a lot of time, no increment. Now it's 8 minutes versus 4. Still, they're playing without increment. White has what looks to be a pretty clean exchange up, but not only can he win on the board, he can also just win on the clock if this game drags out for some time. So, looking good for Basi Maman. He's going to try to convert this Armageddon and uh, advance to the next stage. F6, F3, and yeah, it's looking like just a clean win for white. King comes in, rooks double, rook comes in. Eventually the rooks, they show why they're worth more than a minor piece in these situations. So really, really tough spot for Aiden. I got to feel like seven minutes was way too aggress aggressive of a bid, especially given his opponent was only willing to bid 13 minutes. So... Aiden could have started the game with like 12 minutes instead of 7, 11 minutes instead of 7. He would have had much, much better chances. Um, but here, yeah, he just didn't have a lot of time in this game. And of course, um, yeah, having less time against a super strong opponent is always going to be very, very tough to deal with. Okay. Now rook to d4. Black here is trying to stay active, hoping to keep the fortress, but it's going to be very tough. Here comes in the rook, rook c7. And now white needs to find a way to keep improving the position. One way is to go king e3 and f4. He plays rook a3. Interesting move, just covering some squares along the third rank. Black plays rook b4, has to keep playing extremely fast. You just can't afford to let any seconds tick off your clock in this format with no increments. And here comes f4. Oh, big move by white. Takes, takes. Now the rook gets included via the g3 square. And this looks devastating for black. King f6, e5. He has to go to h5 just to avoid the immediate mate in one. But now rook takes g7, followed by rook h3 is a mate. It's not over, though. Rook takes g7, there's going to be fe4. Only move to stop rook h3. And then it should still be winning for white, but of course the situation could quickly get out of hand. Especially if white starts giving up all the pawns, searching for mate, and then doesn't actually have one. So this game's still not over. Amin has to uh, convert and, uh, and win this one. And he's thinking about it. He hasn't grabbed on g7 yet. I think he doesn't really want to take without fully calculating what's going on on f takes e4. Rook takes g7, f e4, and then some rook to g6. Bishop f5. Okay, starts with rook e7, hitting the bishop. Unpleasant move for black to face. Where to go? Where does this bishop go? Bishop back to c8. Now if takes, there's still fe4. 
Thinking about it though, maybe e5? Takes, rook takes e4. Interesting, he took with this rook. Just keeps all the pawns alive and... Okay, he's just going the full technical route. Now white has an exchange and a pawn. Black's king totally sideline on h5, so it should be just winning for white. f5. Takes, what does he want? Rook e5 looks like just game over but meanwhile this f1 is running so yeah basi Maman, he's just winning this one he's totally cruising here i think i think it's cooked i mean black's nine on a5 yeah it's just way too far and uh sulamanli resigns unfortunately um but he still has a chance because he just gets knocked down to the loser's bracket and uh He's still going to have a second life in this tournament. In the meantime, we have Nepo, Fedoseyev, game four. Must win situation for Fedoseyev, as far as I understand. He's kind of down a piece at the moment. Fedoseyev won the first game, then Nepo roared back, winning the second and third game. And now we're in this game four, uh, which is going to clinch the match for Nepo if you can just uh, finish it off. I mean, it looks just completely winning for Black. He's got an extra piece and the counterplay is coming. If White gives Black one move, I mean, White is just going to get mated here. So... Yeah, Nepo, since that first game. That first game, he should have won as well. He just he, he messed up in the critical moments. Probably went to the bathroom, splashed some water on his face. And, uh, yeah, completely woke up since then. Just crushing the next two games and now winning, winning this one as well, looks like. Or at least forcing a draw, whatever he wants at this point. If he wants to force a draw, he has it. If he wants to win, he has it. Uh, he's, yeah, got all kinds of checks now. And this is just a matter of calculation to finish this off. White's king is just way too weak. He also has rook c5 check if he just wants to win the technical route, just trading off the rooks. He's got an extra bishop in the position. He's holding f7. And, uh, yeah, there's just no... Uh, oh, all right, well... <laughs> That's a great way to end it. F6 check forces the resignation because king f5, queen g5 is going to be mate. And uh, that's it. Nepo wins the next three games of the match and qualifies to the next stage of Division 2. So I think that's it for yeah all the matches uh, in the winner's bracket. So Nepo beats Fedoseyev 3-1. He's going to play Basim Amen tomorrow in uh, what should be a very, very interesting match. And then Artemiev also advances 25 half, half. He's going to play Aronian tomorrow in what's going to be a complete toss-up as well. Now, loser's bracket, I think they're going to be playing more games uh, today. We have Mamadov eliminating Sarin, Alexeyev defeating Dreyev. Uh, Yakubov beating Aturazaga and Esipenko defeating Shigaev. In fact, actually, in fact, folks, I have I have a special bracket screen for you here, showing the uh, the results of the losers division, so you guys can see it for yourselves. So these guys are going to continue the winners to try and. Uh, advance to the next round and they're going to be playing 
uh, some of the losers from today's matches as well. So let's see if we have more games coming up. So I'm getting word, I think that might be it. Okay, no more games for today. So that's it for Division 2. Let me get back to the winner's bracket. So we'll be back tomorrow uh, to cover the next stage of games. So once again, it's going to be Aronian against Artemiev and Nepo versus Amin. Uh, so some very interesting matches coming up. One of these players is going to be able to qualify for Division 1, but they're still going to have to win a couple more matches and then defeat the eventual winner of the loser's bracket. So, uh, yeah, still lots and lots of chess to be played. Um, I think that's going to do it for this stream, folks. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for following. Sente, thanks for subscribing. Tier 2. Thanks for the six months. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now, I don't know if you guys remember David, but uh, we, let me tell you guys what was supposed to happen today. We were supposed to do, we were planning, we had scheduled a dojo talk to happen for today after this show. It was going to happen in about 90 minutes, 12 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, one of us got the time wrong. Not me, not David. One of us. Of the three. <laughs> not me, not David. So the dojo talk isn't happening. But uh, I think David is still going to be around in about 90 minutes. So my plan is to... Um, maybe try to do a zoom call with him because I don't think he has sufficient Wi-Fi yet to stream that's what it sounds like but it does seem like he has good Wi-Fi enough to at least join us on an audio zoom call so maybe we can um, you know just do like a brief check-in with David see what's up with him I'm sure people have have questions or, or want to catch up and, and hear how he's doing um, so maybe I'll be back in about well, I don't know. I actually might keep streaming for now. I'm not sure if I'm going to end the stream right this second, but um, we'll definitely we'll definitely try to stream with David in about 90 minutes. So I think I'll take a break right now just to catch my breath a bit after this one. Uh, I'll probably keep the stream going. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do. We got, oh my God, so much to do at, at the, oh, I can't even breathe. We have so, we have so much to do. I can't, even, I can't even breathe. I can't even breathe. We have so much to do. Um, we have a lot to do. So there's a lot of work to do. Maybe I'll do some of that, you know, and, and you guys can just like chill or hang out. <laughs> and we could, uh, we can just hang on the stream. Maybe we can watch some Division One games. I don't think we're, it's not exactly our job. We're, we're supposed to be covering Division Two. Division Two is over for the day. So I think we're Within reason, you know, we're probably allowed to check out Division One. I. I don't think there's a embargo or something. Maybe we can check out some Division One games. <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. Uh, during the uh, during the while Division Two games are ongoing, I would say no. Actually, honestly, I think we're allowed to do whatever we want. It's it's our stream. Um, but uh, but okay, during Division Two, it would be a little bit strange because there's a separate separate show for Division One and a separate show for Division Three. Um, if you guys are unaware, uh, Ben and Karen, they're covering Division 3. That might still be ongoing. So if you guys want to go watch that, I mean, by all means, you're, you're more than welcome to. I won't be offended. But yeah, we'll try to stream with David in about 90 minutes. So 12 p.m. Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Europe time. Because um, David, for anyone that doesn't know, recently moved to France. Viva la France. And uh, he's going to be there now, like physically. That's where his his uh, his body is, like his human body, uh, is in the country, the physical country of France. So, um, yeah, he's over there. It's a different time for him. Sometimes it's even a different day, depending on when exactly we're, <laughs> we're connecting. 
But uh, yeah, he's on Europe time, and we're going to be... Hopefully we'll get him on uh, on the stream to uh, to just check in. And then we're going to try to do the Dojo Talk tomorrow. We're going to try to do Dojo Talks tomorrow. We'll see if David is free. Uh, I'm not sure. But we'll try to make it happen. I'll be here every day, uh, Friday and Saturday, um, covering the event. Sunday, though, Sunday I'm going to need some help, folks. I don't know if someone is, uh, is around. Maybe... Maybe SM Pooh Bear would be interested. I don't know. Um, Sunday, though, I am looking for someone to to cover the final of Division 2 because I'm going to be playing a tournament, and I will be playing that morning. So I won't be able to watch the final of Division 2, and I'm hoping we have someone that can cover the stream. Uh, if not, I mean, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out, but... I'm just putting the word out. We are looking for hopefully two people. I think two people doing it is more fun than one. Um, hopefully we can find two people to cover Division 2 that are that are interested. We'll see. We'll see. It's always hard. It's always hard. Everyone's so busy. Everyone's doing stuff. They're all, all booked up. I mean, I get it. I get it. Um, it would be like 8 a.m. until possibly noon, but also possibly like it could be done right now, <laughs> like, <laughs> like we are here. So start time would be 8 a.m. Pacific, and then it would either be one match or, or two, but it would basically finish, I would think, around 11 a.m., 11 to 12, basically. That's when they these uh, these shows usually usually finish. Okay, yeah, folks, we are doing a lot these days, working on the dojo, the Discord, the website, everything, everything. But we're taking we're taking our time, you know, step by step. So you just gotta just gotta bear with us as we adjust. <laughs> And uh, try to improve things. Hey, Zero Sum, long time. Thanks for the 26 months. So thanks for following, Egon. I should stream an avocado toast making session, huh? Yeah, I mean, why not, right? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Be, be kind of quick, right? It'd be like a 15-minute stream. Like a quick, you know, starting soon. Five minutes. All right, hey, what's up, everyone? Make some avocado toast. Toast the bread. Cut open the avocado. Disappointed because it's not ripe enough. Here's the thing that I don't understand. How do you... How do you know if the avocado would... I always have such bad luck, honestly, when I get my own avocados. Like, how do you know when it's ripe? It's like, it, it never, like, I just don't get it. Like, it feels soft, and then I open it, and it's it's already gone bad. And it feels soft, and I open it, and it's like, it's not ready. It's way too firm. And I just don't understand what I'm doing wrong. Did I make the cheese? No, I did not. I mean, I'm traveling right now, so I'm in no... Um, I'm in no mood to uh, to go out and buy groceries and, and make new stuff right now. Uh, <laughs> but I also I'm not super interested in the the vegan cheese. I mean, you know, maybe when I do the pasta, do some pasta, I might do it. But it hasn't, it's not a top priority for me. It hasn't been a top priority. Oh, 
Oh, you pop in the fridge, huh? Oh, that's smart. Because then that prolongs the... Because uh... then they're almost ready. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> Oh boy folks I got a lot to do and very little of it um, seems doable on stream all right so we're gonna take a break we'll end it we'll raid and, uh, and then maybe we'll be back later with David um, if he's around I'm not even sure maybe something will happen who knows um, but yeah, hopefully if we stream again today. I'll be with David, uh, but we'll see. Otherwise, I will catch you guys later, at least tomorrow, for the uh, Champions Chess Tour. So bye for now. Um, let's see, who are we going to... Gonna raid Ben and Karen. Are they still going Division Three? Seems like they are. All right, let's raid Ben and Karen. You guys go drop them a follow and uh, catch you all next time. Take care.